Good morning, and welcome to you, to all of you on this first Sunday in July. Can you believe it? We're happy to have you joining us online today. You know, we're only a month away from in-person worship on a Sunday, where our tradition service will be back in the chapel. And if this is your first time joining us online, welcome. We're so happy to have you today. Vicar Mike Skunis, one of our pastors in training, will continue our ancient prayer message today. You may recall our introduction to the Gregorian chant last Sunday. This music from the 8th and 9th centuries was written using a very special notation. You may have seen photos of Gregorian chants, like this one, where you see squares on the page with the Latin words underneath. These notes, called nooms, are placed on a four-line staff instead of the more familiar five-line version that we know. The reason is that the range of these medieval melodies was less than what we have today in modern music. A num consists of one note or a group of notes sung over a single syllable. Gregorian chant is monophonic, meaning we're looking at a single musical line without accompaniment. These are sung not in major or minor keys, but rather in modes. This square notation was the method used to write music until about the 16th century. We actually know very little about how these chants were originally performed, but Gregorian chant has been with us since medieval times. Today, Anna is going to sing a chant that was associated with Easter. It's called O Filili et Filiae, which translates as Ye Sons and Daughters of the Lord. today is Guide Me Ever Great Redeemer. It was originally written in Welsh by a Methodist preacher, William Williams, in 1762. There are a few differences from hymnal to hymnal. In many hymnals, you'll see a title, Guide Me Ever Great Jehovah, but in our Lutheran hymnal, the title is Guide Me Ever Great Redeemer. Williams weaves together imagery from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, to evoke a sense of God's guidance through strife. This hymn affirms the reality that God provides for us and redeems all the wrong in the world. Please join Anna in singing this special hymn.
We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit. May it rise within our community. May it bolster our spirit and help us to follow after you. God, we are desperate to know you and to trust you, to follow in your ways so that we might better love you and love our neighbors. So God, bless us now. Bless uh, the words that we lift up to you and bless the praises that we lift into the community. God, we love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. My name is Mike Skunis. I'm one of the vicars on staff here at Christ Church, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying pastor in training. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are in week two of our Ancient Prayers series, where we look at the big, bold prayers of the Old Testament. And specifically today, we are looking at a prayer said by Moses that changes history. Now, before we get into this prayer that changes history, we need a little bit of context, a little bit of backstory on what's going on before this prayer happens. And so I need to tell you a story, a love story of sorts, between God and the Israelites. And so the Israelites were enslaved for almost 400 years in the lands of Egypt. And they were in terrible conditions. They were oppressed. They had very little to eat. They had no freedom. And they cried out to God, for liberation. God heard their cries and appointed Moses to be their leader, to go free them from Pharaoh in Egypt and bring them into the promised land, this land that would be flowing with milk and honey, that had plenty of pasture for their cattle to graze, that they would not only be free from Egypt, but they would have land of their own. So God sends Moses to Pharaoh and Moses confronts Pharaoh and eventually, after 10 plagues, the Pharaoh uh, relents and allows the Israelites to leave. And so they start walking towards the Red Sea. Pharaoh changes his mind and sends his army after them as they approach the Red Sea. And this is where we get our famous story of Moses parting the Red Sea. And the Israelites walk across on dry land. And then as the waters come back, they swallow up Pharaoh's army. So God loves the Israelites so much that he liberates them from Egypt, that he does signs and miracles for them, and he promises them this great land that they'll be journeying to. And so our story picks up on the precipice of them entering into the promised land. They're about to achieve their happily ever after, that they have been God's people, God has been their God, and they're about to be in the promised land. And so God descends among them um, and has these wonderful words to say to them. God says, Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. 
And the Lord said to Moses, I will disown the Israelites and destroy them with a plague. Yee. Uh, awkward. Um, yeah, that doesn't sound um, like things are going very well, right? Um, that something very rocky must have happened in their relationship in between the liberation from Egypt and from them getting to the promised land. Um, and in fact, we're going to talk about what I think of as a road trip gone awry. Um, that they were on this journey from Egypt to the promised land in Cana, and a lot of stuff happened that didn't quite go the right way, either for the Israelites or for God. And so we're going to take a look at a map so you can see where their journey took them. So now, in the upper left-hand corner of the map, you can see where Egypt is and where um, Ramses, the pharaoh of Egypt, probably lived. Uh, and this is where they were liberated from. And to give you an idea of how big the group of Israelites were, they were about 600,000 men just over the age of 20. They didn't count women in these counts. And so when you add in women and children, they're traveling with a population roughly the size of Nebraska. And so they leave Egypt, and you can see the arrows kind of going down as they cross over into the Red Sea, um, and they start heading south. Now that's kind of weird because the promised land is in Cana, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. You can kind of see Cana up there. Um, and the distance between Egypt and Cana is only about 200 to about 250 miles. And so even a group of this size should be able to walk that distance in approximately three weeks. But something goes terribly wrong. It takes them almost three years because they take this long, windy route through the wilderness. They go down to Mount Sinai, which is at the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula, and they come back up. Um, and if you can see the number 12 on this map in Kadesh, this is about where they are. And so um, what happened um, that God is so angry with the Israelites right as they're about to have they're happily ever after. Well, you can imagine that with any road trip, uh, there's going to be some complaining. So if you've ever been on a road trip, you know the common complaints, right? And the Israelites have all of them. They are, are we lost? I'm hungry. Hey, hey, stop touching my stuff. And are we there yet? So the Israelites have all of these complaints and concerns, but the thing is that God loves the Israelite people so much that God responds with love and compassion and mercy at every step of the way. And so God addresses each of these individual concerns. And so when the people say, are we lost? Do we even know where we are going? God sends a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them on their way. When the Israelites complain about being hungry, they say, oh, like, why did we leave Egypt only to starve in the wilderness? Man, when we were back in Egypt, you know, we had pots of meat and we had bread to our fill, which was all of a lie because they were in slavery and they definitely were not well fed and they did not get meat every night. But God, again, loving them very well, um, sends them manna, which is this bread-like substance. And manna shows up in the morning, and in the evening, there is quail for them to hunt. So God provides for them when they are hungry. And when the Israelites starting having uh, interpersonal conflict with one another, um, the, hey, don't touch my stuff, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Um, and so on two stone tablets, writes out these Ten Commandments that are to govern the Israelites um, as an act of love. Now, quick sidebar, while Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, um, the Israelites are away from Moses, and they do something really, really bad. God really only has a couple conditions of the Israelite people, and one of the big ones is to not make any graven image um, made out of metal, um, because there is no way that we can imagine God and put him into a form. And any of our attempts to do so would be an idol. And so while Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, the Israelite people say, God has abandoned us, let us make a idol like all of the other nations, and we will worship that idol instead. And so they take all of their gold, all of their jewelry, and they melt it all down, and they create a golden calf. 
and they start praising and worshiping that. And when God sees this, and when Moses sees this, they are furious. And actually, the original Ten Commandments, Moses smashes those two tablets in anger and frustration over the golden calf. Now, sometimes I think we underplay how much of a sin idolatry is. Um, But just imagine for a second, um, especially ladies, imagine that it's Mother's Day and your child comes up to you and is like, hey mom, I made this card for you. I drew a picture of you. And you're like, oh, that's so sweet. Did you draw me as a cow? Like you would be pretty mad too, right? Um, And I think God is very justifiably angry that this happened. And so not only are the Israelites complainers, but they're ungrateful. They fail to trust God. They fail to honor God at every step of the way. And eventually God, despite all of these things, still provides them with the promised land and brings them to the promised land. So as they are on the edge of the promised land, um, they decide to investigate the land. So there are 12 tribes of Israel, and so each tribe appoints one person to go check it out together in a group and then go report back to the group. And so they send out 12 spies, two of them being Joshua and Caleb, and we'll get to Joshua and Caleb in just a second. So the spies go to Cana, they go to the promised land, and then they come back and they report to the people. And 10 of the spies, this is their report. They say, hey, God came through and the land that God promised us is just as amazing as he said it was. It's flowing with milk and honey. There's plenty of pasture space for our cattle. This land is awesome. But there's one big problem. There's already people that live there. And not only there are people that are live there, but they to us seem like giants. They are big and scary. And if we try to go into the land of Cana, they're going to straight up murder us and no one's going to be happy. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they say, yes, this land that God has promised us is great and good. And yes, there are people that live there already, but God is with us and God is by our side. And we expect God to be with us and help us prevail and survive as we move into this land. Um, And I don't know about you guys, but when it's 10 verses 2, who do you think the people believe more, Joshua and Caleb or the other 10 spies? Well, let's hear their response. So the people then say, Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron, the two leaders of the Israelites. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted amongst themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Wow. Uh, That is a lot. Now, what's amazing is that God has already proven himself time and time again to be faithful. Everything from the miracles that allowed them to leave Egypt to the ones that sustained them while they were in the wilderness, the people still don't trust God after all of this. And not only do they not trust God, but they are willing to commit mutiny against Moses and Aaron because they are so afraid of having to face the people in the promised land. So it's completely understandable that God is angry and upset Um, and is just so frustrated with the Israelites. So Moses and God have a conversation, and God comes to Moses and says, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me, even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? And so God finally considers the nuclear option, and that's where we see... uh, at the beginning of the story when he says, um, you know, I am ready to destroy and disown these Israelites. Um, It says that he's even ready to start over from scratch. God says, I will disown the Israelites and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you, Moses, into a greater and mightier nation than they were. So basically God says, 
I give up. I give up. I've had enough of this. I am ready to start over because these people cannot stay faithful. They cannot trust me no matter what I do. And so Moses, you who are faithful and just, I'm going to make a new nation out of you. And it's going to be greater and mightier than the entire state of Nebraska. (laughs) Now Moses is kind of in a tough spot. Because Moses loves God and Moses trusts God. But he's also the leader of almost two million people. That is a lot of people that he knows and loves. And many of those people are his family and his relatives. And he has put so much energy and effort in delivering them out of Egypt to take them to the promised land. And so Moses is in a sticky situation where the two people he loves, God and his people, are at odds with one another. And so Moses does the most amazing thing. Moses prays a beautiful prayer of petition to God. And he prays on behalf of the Israelites to God. So let's take a second to check out what that prayer is. Moses prays to God saying, Please, Lord, prove that your power is as great as you have claimed. For you said, the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. Now this this is a beautiful prayer that Moses prays in order to save the Israelites from destruction. But what is almost audacious about this prayer is that in some of those lines, Moses is quoting God back to God's self. Um, That in fact, some of the words that Moses is using is directly taken from Exodus 34 verses 6 through 7 in which God describes his essential character to Moses. And Moses, because he spends so much time in prayer and relationship with God, has internalized these characteristics, these qualities of God, and knows God so well to know that God's anger and his willingness to destroy the Israelites in frustration is in fact out of character for God. Because Moses has such a deep and strong relationship with God. Moses is able to quote back to God these essential qualities of love and mercy, kindness, forgiveness that is slow to anger and quick to forgive. And you know what? It works. God chooses not to destroy the Israelites. But here's the other thing about God's character, that God is not fully just love and slow to anger, but God is also one who is just. And so he tells Moses, he says, you are right. It would be out of character for me to destroy these people whom I love. But here's the thing. They have refused to trust me and they have refused to go into the promised land. And you know what? I am going to honor their request. So for every person who is over 20 years old, except for Joshua and Caleb, who have been faithful to me, none of them will see the promised land. And in fact, you are going to wander in the wilderness for another 37 years before you are able to enter the promised land, making a grand total of 40 years that they will be wandering in the wilderness before they can finally taste the fruits of God's promise. Now, this is a story of a ton of ups and downs, And so I think the question that comes to me after hearing this story is, what can we learn? What can we learn about our relationship with God? And what can we learn about prayer through Moses? I think the big thing for me is that we are called to know God and to trust God. And to me, there's only three ways that we can develop that relationship in which we know God and trust God enough to follow even when things get scary, even when there are a slew of enemies before us, there's only three ways that we can know God and trust God well enough to follow him no matter what. The first is prayer. 
Now, Moses spends an inordinate amount of time in prayer with God. In fact, I was telling you about the Ten Commandments story. So God is talking to Moses up on the top of Mount Sinai. And part of the reason why the Israelites get anxious and create the golden calf is because Moses spent 40 days in prayer with God. Isn't that amazing? He spent 40 days in prayer with God uh, away from his people that he separated himself to just have a conversation with God. So Moses, through prayer, knows God better than anyone. And the thing is that this is not exclusive to Moses. We have access to that type of intimate knowledge of God through prayer ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly have never spent 40 days in prayer. I don't even know if I've spent four hours in prayer before, maybe 40 minutes, but um, definitely not 40 days. And so in order to build up our relationship with God, we need to just start talking with him. Sometimes we get really scared of prayer and we think of it as um, this thing that only pastors can do or really holy or religious people can do. But when you boil it down, prayer is just having a conversation with God. And Moses knows this, that he is able to have that consistent conversation with God through prayer. Now, the other way that we know and trust God is through Scripture. Moses even leans on Scripture. He leans on God's own word to then um, reflect on what God is doing and saying next. And so sometimes I think we have this ability to get in prayer and we're like, oh, yes, God is talking to me. He's saying something. But we don't measure it against the words that God has already said historically and has written down in Scripture. But we have to measure what God, what we think we hear in prayer against Scripture. Then the last thing is community that we get to know God and trust God through the stories about God told to us by other people and through the experiences that we have with our community. And so sometimes we might go into prayer and be like, oh yeah, God's telling me something really great. And then we come into um, relationship with other people um, and it comes in conflict um, with what other people believe. And so we need that conversation with our community to help um, temper what it is we know and trust about God. Now, prayer can be so powerful. Um, and I think some of the takeaways that we can get from these stories is to be like some of these characters. I think Joshua and Caleb stand out to me because Joshua and Caleb, they knew God so well that they trusted him even when everyone else was scared. When they were faced with an obstacle, that seemed insurmountable, these giant people that were likely to destroy them in battle, they said, we know God. God has done miraculous things for our people and in our lives, and we trust God to see us through. And so you, through prayer, can have the ability to trust God and follow God, even when everybody else around you is saying something different. Now, from Moses, we can learn two things. First is that Moses knew God so well that he was able to remind God of God's essential character, that he knew God inside and out, and even took the risk of quoting God back to God's self. And to me, that's pretty risky because I don't really like having my own words flung back into my face, um, but... I am able to hear a good, wise word from others when I have a strong relationship with them. And so Moses had such a strong relationship with God that he was able to quote God back to God's self and remind God of the loving, merciful, caring God that he is. The last thing that we can learn is that Moses had such a strong relationship with God that he could leverage it to save others. That you, you have the ability in your prayer life to petition on behalf of the people that you love, the people in our community, and even in the people who are lost and far away from God. 
that as you build up your relationship with God through prayer and scripture and community, you have the ability to save others, to make the world a better place, and that is powerful and should not be overlooked. So may you have big, bold prayers. May you start up that relationship with God today and start praying. So join me now as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you are loving and merciful, that you are slow to anger and that you forgive us for a multitude of sins, that you are faithful no matter how unfaithful we are. God, help us to know you. Help us to know who you are and what you are doing in the world so we can trust you and follow you. God, help us to know you and trust you so much that we can save the people around us, that we can make their lives better and deliver them from the situations that threaten to drag them down. God, I ask that you bless our community at Christ Church. May we know you and remember you. May we know your words and lean on them so that we can continue to follow you and continue to create your kingdom here on earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Christian's name
Christ Church. I'm Pastor Bob, one of the pastors here at Christ Church. Uh, God loves it when we reach out to Him in prayer. He also rejoices when we stand up in this world and say, yes, uh, we're His and we believe. Please join me as we proclaim our faith, joining our voices with the saints of ages of old as we join together in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, from generation to generation, you have heard the cries and the prayers of your people. You have listened to the saints of old like Abraham and Moses, and you have willingly answered, seeking only the best for your people and always doing what is right. So this day we boldly and humbly come before you and we pray. We ask that you would hear our cries in this time and in this place. Lord, be with all those who continue to struggle in their body with sickness. Please let your hand of healing rest upon them. Give them patience, perseverance, and strength that they could be renewed. Lord, we pray for those who continue to be hungry, those who go without, that they might be sustained that you would uh, lead others into their lives to bring provision and opportunity. Lord, we pray for our nation, for not only our leaders and those making important decisions in these days, but we pray for those who are angry, for those who are hurting. We ask that you would just come into this world in a powerful new way through your Holy Spirit and that you would bring peace and understanding, conversation and openness. Help us, all of us, to be more and more like Christ. Lord, we continue to lift before you uh, Christ Church. Uh, even though we have been separated over these weeks, we know that we stay united in our faith. We stay united in our cause and in our mission. And Lord, we ask, prepare the way for us now as we're in worship together, as we get ready for Sunday mornings together. Prepare the way that we could uh, rejoice and give thanks for all of your goodness, especially in times of challenge and times of struggle. That like Moses, we can simply turn to you and rely on you. So Lord, we do that as your children today. And we join our hearts and we join our voices and we pray together the way Jesus taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the privileges we have as God's people is to rely on the very nature and the goodness of God and to lean into his grace and his forgiveness. He invites us to receive that word of forgiveness into our life and to just trust it and just believe it. So I invite you to join me in coming before the Lord humbly, opening up our hearts, emptying ourselves before him, and letting him fill us once again with his forgiveness and with his love for us. Dear friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please join me as we confess. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, he does forgive us all of our sins. As a called and ordained of the minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ Church, we rejoice today in being able to worship with you. Uh, equally, we rejoice in being able to continue to join in radical generosity. Uh, we have a radically generous God. Uh, he continues to love us and forgive us and lead us. And so uh, we just invite you to continue to step into that radical generosity. Go ahead uh, and give online or if you want to just mail something in, uh, what, whatever works for you. Uh, the biggest thing is don't forget to step into radical generosity. It is part of what feeds our faith uh, and our life uh, together. Uh, we also have the opportunity, as the campus is now open here at Christ Church, uh, to be strengthened and encouraged each week on Thursday nights as we uh, get together on Thursday nights uh, for a service around communion. And so we want to invite you to go ahead and join us uh, if you're comfortable on Thursday nights. Uh, and uh, just go to the webpage. Let us know you're coming, though, uh, so we make sure that we can prepare for you uh, and know that our commitment uh, is to have a safe place uh, that you can come and then also a place where you can hear the gospel and be impacted by the goodness of God. So join us on uh, Thursday nights, and then we're excited as we get closer and closer to uh, August 2nd when we'll be worshiping once again uh, on uh, Sunday morning. So put that on your calendar, uh, share it with other Christ followers. Great time to make an invitation to people uh, that are far away from God to say, hey, in this time, what a better time to step into understanding what God wants for you 
so go ahead and invite others as we get ready to open up uh, on Sunday mornings uh, on August 2nd. So lots going on at Christ Church. Check out the webpage, get involved. Small groups, get into one of those small groups. Our ancient prayer small groups are underway. Some of them are happening online. Some of them are happening in homes. Some are happening here on campus. The big thing is they're happening, and you should be happening with it. You should be part of that. So get engaged as we come together again and we get used to being around each other in ministry and care and compassion for one another. Uh, Also, our prayer line is open, so reach out, get folks praying Uh, into your life. Make sure you take advantage of that. Let's end with our closing uh, hymn. Today we are ending with um, a beloved hymn I know many of you love, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And Martin Luther wrote the words and composed the melody somewhere around 1527. Um, And the words are a paraphrase from Psalm 46. And though that was about 500 years ago that he wrote these words, uh, they still ring true today. When life storms blow in around us, we can find refuge in the mighty fortress of our God. Please sing with me as we close today. Christ Church, thanks for being with us today in worship. Hope you're having a great uh, Fourth of July weekend. Remember, keep praying. Keep praying for our nation uh, as we keep moving forward, not only as a nation, but keep also praying for Christ Church as we move forward. Dear friends, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week as we gather again online to worship and praise. See you next week.